This morning as we come together, we have an advantage even over the women who came early in the morning as the first day of the week was dawning. They came to behold the sepulcher, to see the sepulcher. But this morning we come to meet Jesus himself. <laughs> Brother Aaron's sermon, as Brother Ricky has already pointed out, comes from Acts 13, verse 37. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. As far as men and the earth are concerned, death and corruption go hand in hand. Life sustains the body so that decay does not enter in where life is present. But when the body and the spirit are parted in death, the earthy part of us is buried, and it is at that time that corruption naturally begins to take place because of the absence of life. <clears throat> we see this to be true in the example of Lazarus. From John 11:39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. But Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. The cause of the smell that Martha was describing was because of the decay that had begun in the body of Lazarus. But in the case of Christ Jesus, God Almighty intervened into the course of earth. Lazarus had been dead four days, but Jesus was raised on the third day before corruption could begin. This was purposed before the foundation of the world, and it was also prophesied before the birth of Christ. Psalm 16, verse 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Amen. Those who spoke in the name of the Lord made a point of this truth. In our text, in Acts, Paul affirmed it, but also on the day of Pentecost, Peter stressed this truth twice. Acts 2, 27 and 31. Why would this be so important? Why would this aspect of the resurrection be so important? It is because with the fulfillment of the promise given, being found in Christ Jesus, it proves both that God is faithful and that Christ is his holy one. <clears throat> Another reason Christ would see no corruption is found in Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. This was not a body that was prepared that could do no sin. This was a body that must have been prepared to house deity. One reason this body would not see corruption is because of what it contained. Christ has the power of an endless life. Therefore, there was no place of entrance for anything associated with death to enter into his body. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 15, 56, we are shown that the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Even though Christ was subject to death, we know that it was not due to any sin or corruption that was found in his life. Therefore, the strength of sin could not hold him, and there would be no corruption in his death either. It is because of Christ that we can also partake of this liberty. 1 Corinthians 15:42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. While we do have a part of us that sin is still able to take hold of, God in Christ Jesus has separated that old man from our new man. The old man, the earthy part of us, will see corruption, but that is only for a time. <clears throat> the new man will not see <clears throat> will not see this corruption because he has been created after the image of him who is pure. The death of Christ brought a transformation in our heart, and his resurrection will also bring a transformation of our body when it will be raised. That will be the day of the redemption of the purchased possession, and it will be then when we will be complete and spotless, bringing glory to him who has worked this great truth in us. Amen. Before Brother Aaron comes, I wanted to share this expression of praise concerning these things from Isaiah. Isaiah 38, 17 through 20 says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back, for the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living shall praise thee as I do this day. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, will we sing songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Amen. Paul was traveling with a company of godly people, as was his uh, manner. 
He always surrounded himself with people who were committed to the Lord, who were uh, trustworthy in the things of God. And Luke tells us in chapter 13 of Acts that he was traveling with a company. They came to the city of Antioch, and as was Paul's custom, they found a synagogue. They found a place where people were speaking about the Lord and about the things of God. The normal schedule in the synagogue was as follows. Read the law, read the prophets, and then open the floor and ask if any man has a word of exhortation for the people. This is then, this is when Paul seized the moment and gave a word of exhortation to the people. He went all the way back and started with the Egyptian bondage. The people were uh, in the land of bondage. The Hebrew people had migrated to Egypt in Joseph's day because of the famine. They ended up being slaves in Egypt for more than 400 years. That's a long time. That's about, that's all, more than twice as long, all, almost twice as long as our country has been a nation. But f after 400 years, the bondage came to an end. It didn't last forever. Paul then, in his exhortation, went to the time of 40 years that the people of the Jews were wandering in the desert, following the pillar of cloud by night, following a pillar of fire by day, a uh, pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. They eat, ate manna every day. They drank water from a rock that followed them. But that, too, came to an end. It didn't last forever. Then Paul, in his exhortation in Antioch, went to the, uh, the Hebrews that entered into the land of Canaan, and the Lord drove out seven nations from before them. The Lord delivered them uh, the land of Canaan by lot, but then that conquest also came to an end. It didn't last forever. After that, God gave his people judges to rule over them for the space of 450 years. The space of judges was longer than their time that they spent in Egypt, 450 years. But that too came to an end. At the time of Samuel the prophet, the, the time of judges came to an end. But then the time of prophets also came to an end because the people asked for a king. And so God gave them um, Saul, the son of Sis, for the space of 40 years as a king to rule over them. But that also came to an end. After Saul, King David took the throne. He had been anointed uh, king long before Saul's life came to an end. He was anointed king, but when Saul's life came to an end, he took the throne as king. And the Lord testified, saying, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. But then David, too, as the others, came to an end. But then, of this man's seed, Paul says in the synagogue in Antioch, of this man's seed, David's seed, according to the promise, the promise that was given to the woman and the man in the garden, the promise that was given uh, to Moses, the promise that was given through, down through the ages, I have found a man, David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And of this man's seed, he raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus, and this man had no end. Amen. Yes. For thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. John the Baptist, who is greater than any man that had ever been born of woman, came to prepare the way for this Savior, and even this man, John's life, came to an end, a dishonorable end, but the one of whom he testified would not come to an end. He would see no corruption. Amen. Jesus lived over 33 years. He preached, taught, and worked miracles.